Can everyone hear me correctly? Yes? Yeah, maybe. So let's go. So first, yes, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Julian. Uh, I was formerly the CEO of Infinite, uh, which was the company that Docker acquired uh, in November. So we are now part of Docker. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, storage, uh, as you can see with the title. Um, and uh, I'll try to do that very quickly because I've got 30 minutes. So covering uh, this in 30 minutes is uh, quite a challenge. So I'll try. Um, so I'll first talk about the platform, so the infinite storage platform and, and the different layers that compose it um, to basically give you an overview of uh, what we do and how we do it um, and how it would be used. And then I'll talk about some aspects of what makes Infinite uh, different from other storage platforms, which doesn't necessarily mean better, even though we think obviously we are trying to do something good, but uh, just to give you some elements about uh, how Infinite is different. And thirdly, you can see that it's written demo, but uh, I won't have time to do a demo. So to be honest, I'll just point you to the right direction and, and, and give you some, some, some ideas about uh, the terminology and how it would actually flow. But uh, I won't do a demo. I know it's a pain because uh, it's kind of demo centric, but uh, that's what I'll do. So first, uh, as a context, uh, to state the obvious, containers are great. They are flexible, fast, lightweight, and scalable. They have been used for stateless applications. Uh, also, Docker has introduced uh, things thanks to containers such as portability and microservices. The idea of splitting, splitting an application into multiple uh, services is great. And I believe that it actually opens interesting doors for uh, storage, and I'll talk about that and how uh, maybe you could actually have uh, a different storage backend for the different microservices composing your application. So statefulness uh, is kind of the next thing, uh, so we believe. Um, uh, it's been good for stateless applications, but now um, enterprises want to bring legacy applications to containers, but also uh, you probably want to deploy uh, stateful applications from databases to storing configuration files to application data uh, that you want to keep within your containers environment and out, outside of it. And what we think is that traditional storage uh, solutions are not suitable uh, because they haven't been designed to scale very quickly, to be flexible, uh, also to be secure, uh, all in all, they haven't been designed for containers. Uh, and what we think is that uh, containers actually require a storage platform which is modern, which doesn't really mean much, but uh, which is elastic, meaning scalable and fault tolerant, but also customizable. And I'll talk about that. So first, the platform. It basically looks like that. I hope you can actually distinguish everything. Uh, I'll dive into every element, but um, the first layer is the key value store that you can see at the top, which is something common for many uh, storage system, uh, software defined storage system, is that basically you install infinite on a set of servers and we aggregate the storage capacity of those servers into it in, in order to create a virtual storage pool. And this key value store can be customized through a set of policies, and I'll talk about that later on. On top of this key value store, you're gonna have a set of logics, which would be different storage types from block, object, and file. Again, I, I, I'll, I'll dive into that in a minute. And on top of those, uh, you have a set of policies which you will be able to use, basically standard protocols, which will be available for you to access uh, one logic, for instance. So you could, for instance, access an object storage through an Amazon F3 API. And on top of that, we also provide utilities from CLI to integration and so on and so forth. So let's talk about the key value store. That's really the most uh, important part of our uh, technology, basically. Um, what makes our key value store uh, specific compared to others 
uh, such as ETCD, for instance, is that it is completely decentralized. And again, I'll talk about that later on, but think of it as most distributed systems tend to use a master-slave model or a leader follower or a metadata uh, and data server uh, uh, model, so master-slave. Um, in our case, we decided to go in a different route by using a completely decentralized model where every node behaves the same, basically. There is no specific node with uh, a specific, specific privileges, for instance. Also, the consensus algorithm, which allows you to maintain consistency, so basically make sure that when a piece of data is uh, modified, uh, the other client requesting it are going to see consistently the same value and not two requests couldn't give you different values, kind of, if I simplify. Um, uh, the, the consensus algorithm uh, is specific in the context of infinite because it is block-based which doesn't mean anything at this point, but I'll explain. And finally, uh, the policies. Um, our key value store, as I mentioned briefly before, can be customized through a set of policies. And that is really important because it allows you to really um, control the behavior of your storage backend. So you're really going to be able to adapt the storage backend to the needs of your application. On top of the key value store, as I mentioned, uh, you have logics, so different types of storage and interfaces. And I'll bundle those together and explain the different types of uh, logics and interfaces because even though it sounds obvious for many people, uh, they tend not to know which one to use in which case. The first one we've introduced in Infinite is a file system. So as you probably know, a file system is an hierarchy of files and folders with access control and stuff like that. So you all have that on your computer, obviously. And in the context of a distributed file system, you tend to have uh, an interface which would be Fuse on Linux, Docker on Windows, could even be NFS, right? The thing is that for, for with distributed file system is that um, you need to be, I mean, not necessarily, but you tend to be POSIX compliant, which is uh, really, uh, uh, in order to be able to support all the types of applications that have, have been developed in the past based on the POSIX uh, uh, compliance so that uh, obviously they can be migrated to your new uh, file system. The problem with uh, file systems is that by definition for a distributed file system, you can actually access the data from multiple nodes, multiple clients, for instance, uh, containers. And the problem is that you need to handle concurrent accesses. So you could have two clients modifying the same uh, file, for instance. And the problem is that that is actually very costly in terms of, algorith of the algorithm that is going to handle the consensus. So it impacts the performance. So all of that to say that if you want to use a distributed file system, just keep in mind that you're going to pay the price regarding those uh, properties. So not to use for everything. So the, the examples range from storing logs, you could use a file system to store logs, configuration file credential, and obviously legacy application that just assume that the file system is going to be POSIX compliant. So that's the first logic. The second one would be object storage that we probably Again, all know, you probably all used Amazon S3, and that's exactly it. It is, to use, uh, to, it is used to store unstructured data, uh, and, and, and the idea is to have something which is very simple. You just store objects in a bucket. There is no relation between the different objects, and that's it. So it's pretty simple. It has been used to store large objects mostly, but not necessarily. But to date, it's used for that. So Netflix uses it for its video. Dropbox used it uh, for uh, the, the data and metadata regarding the files of their users, and so on. And finally, block devices. So this is really a system level uh, um, uh, logic. The idea is to provide a network partition that you are going to be able to format into the file system of your choice. So really think of that as a slash dev slash something. 
you format that into X4, and that's it. You have a file system which look as before, except that in the back end, it is not stored on your hard disk, but distributed between uh, multiple servers. The thing with block devices is that um, inherently, <coughs> historically, uh, the block device represents a partition on a hard disk which is within your computer. So the kernel that is uh, managing the block device assumes that it is the only one accessing it, reading and writing. So different from a file system that can be accessed from different nodes, in this context, only the kernel is accessing the block device, which means that the concurrent accesses are all going from, can come from different applications going through the same kernel to the block device. And that means that the kernel can optimize accesses from caching to anything you can imagine, right? It knows exactly what's happening. In other words, a file on the block device cannot be updated by another node. So if you were to, for instance, deploy a database, uh, I would strongly advise not to deploy a database on a file system because a file system, a distributed file system, provides you with concurrent access control, all right? Uh, you can, it is designed so that uh, concurrent accesses are not going to fail. But for a database, the files stored by the database on disk are not, are not supposed to be edited by anyone else, only the front end of your database. So if you were to deploy a database, I would strongly advise you to use a block device because it is going to be optimized for that, which means more efficient. There is one takeaway, it's basically that. So let's take an example. Um, Let's assume that you've got an, an application uh, which is split into multiple microservices like WordPress, and the WordPress uh, application actually has three uh, data flows. Uh, it is storing configuration files. Uh, it is also storing big images and videos, and finally the content of the blog post are stored in a database. In a normal deployment, uh, in an enterprise, for instance, you would tend to store everything in an EMC appliance and you don't really care, and that's it. But actually, I think that with software-defined storage solution plus microservices with containers, you actually have the ability to really customize the storage backend to the needs, the precise needs of the application or the microservice. So in this context, you could imagine having your database being stored on a file system which is X4, which is actually backed by a block device, on a key value store which is infinite key value store. So you would have a single key value store in this context with three storage, three logics. The first one would be a block device, which you would customize to have a block size, for instance, of 500 and, and 12 byte uh, per block, because that's probably what the database ex expects and you would activate replication. You have a block device with a nice SCSI uh, interface, and you format that in X4, and you put your database in that. That's it. Now, for the configuration files, you could have a file system, let's say, with an NFS interface, and you activate replication, versioning, and deduplication, just to give an example. And finally, for the, for the large objects, which, again, is a different workflow, a different data flow, uh, you would actually deploy an object storage logic on top of the same key value store with an Amazon S3 API, and you would configure it so that as to have a one megabyte block size because you want it to be bigger, and activate uh, a data center aware uh, placement policy so that two replicas do not end up in the same data center, and finally, you would use erasure coding and compression because it's better for large data sets. So that would be an example of how infinite could be used on a storage cluster. So you would have a single storage cluster on, on top of which you would create multiple um, uh, storage logics with different interfaces, different customization because every flow is different and requires a backend uh, that really suits uh, the application's need. That's just an example. So that's. To summarize, just to re-give you the, 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 the illustration, the key value store with some policies, 
then uh, logics with policies as well. You can have as many as you want. So you can create 10 object storage uh, logics on the same key value store, each one, for instance, with its own policies, and finally, interfaces to access the data. Now let's dive into what makes Infinite different from other systems. So I picked only two aspects because again, we are very limited in time. Um, so I'll, I'll dive into those, uh, but sorry, because I could stretch that for hours, but we don't have time. So the first aspect is the distribution. And I mentioned that in the very beginning is that um, most distributed systems tend to rely on the master-slave uh, model. In our case, we went for a decentralized. So basically, we use peer-to-peer -peer protocols. And that means that any operation could have been so can, performed by one node, could have been carried out by another one. There is no distinction, distri distinction between the nodes. It's a bit simplified, but uh, that's the idea, OK? And this is really, really important uh, in our model. It complexifies some aspect, and it's very difficult to do at first. But when you do it, you have tons of benefits, and I'll try to convince you of that uh, now. So the first uh, thing is that um, we rely on two key constructs, uh, which are a novel network and a distributed hash table. So the, the overlay network must not be confused with an overlay network within Docker, so it has nothing to do uh, with that. So an overlay network in the context of Docker is basically a VPN. In our case, an overlay network is a logical connection between the nodes and an algorithm to find the node or the nodes responsible for a piece of information. Remember that we are in a decentralized environment, so we don't have a central entity that can know this block is there, this block is there, and this block is there. We don't have that. So we need to find a way to collaboratively find the node or the nodes that host the replicas of one block. Does that make sense? So the open network is all about scalability uh, and this algorithm about I'm going to find uh, uh, one node or, or several nodes that host the replica of the block I'm looking for. The distributed hash table is a construct on top of the overlay network that provides you with a very simple API, very much like a key value store, which is put block, uh, get block, and erase block. Okay? So very simple. But the distributed hash table must ensure redundancy. So if you activate the redundancy policy, it must make sure that the redundancy of every piece of data is maintained at any time. It must maintain consistency, meaning if a piece of data is modified, uh, consistency is maintained. And one thing that I haven't mentioned so far is that most uh, key value stores ensure uh, eventual consistency, but we are strongly consistent which is uh, when you store a data, a piece of data, or you update a piece of data, any future request will get the modification, which is different from a three, for instance, which is eventually consistent. We can emulate uh, eventual consistency if we are strongly consistent, obviously, but the other way around is not possible. The distributed hash table must also deal with self-healing, which is a failure occur, such as a server goes down, what happens? The system must readapt, maybe move blocks around, maybe recreate missing replicas. That's the role of the distributed hash table. And the mutability is, again, another story, and I won't go into that. But just to say that the goal of the distributed hash table is to uh, guarantee two properties at any time, which is availability and durability. Availability is I can access any data at any time. And durability is, you never lose my data. If I store it, I must get it back. The other aspect that makes Infinite specific, uh, different from others, is the consensus algorithm. And I already talked about that, but I'll keep talking about that because it is a kind of a key point. Um, as I mentioned, most uh, distributed systems rely on managers, masters, uh, leaders, whatever you call them. And those managers are 
uh, very critical. If they fail, you've got a bigger problem than if the other servers fail. And those uh, servers are often uh, used to organize the whole system and to authorize some specific uh, operations. For instance, in Docker Swarm mode, uh, you have managers, and those are specific, right? And, and the master-slave model can suit some uh, distributed systems where you don't have an heavy reliance on the, ma on, on the managers. It is the case, for instance, for Docker Swarm. For a storage system, we believe that it's not the case because the managers or the metadata servers are going to be requested a lot. So we believe that it is not a right model to use the master slave. That's why we decided to go for a decentralized model. Now, the quorum, the, 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 the sets, the quorum of managers uh, must uh, be contacted to reach an agreement whenever you must perform a specific operation, such as updating a block, for instance. And the problem with the design of having managers is that uh, they can act as bottlenecks. Uh, if you have too many clients doing too many requests, you're fucked. And the problem is that these manager nodes, you can't scale them out as easily as the other servers. Uh, often you need to have someone who is really skilled in uh, operating such a system. Sometimes you need to actually stop the service to do that. All that to say that you cannot uh, scale out those manager nodes automatically and simply. The other problem is that uh, that can lead to a cascading effect where you have one manager node, one metadata, metadata server, server that goes down, the clients are going to redirect their request to the other one, which are going to be overloaded, fail, and so on and so forth until everything fails. So that's a big problem. And finally, you could even say that uh, it's ideal to get privileges, uh, to escalate your privileges, because you just have to attack those servers, and that's it. In a decentralized model, there is no more important server to attack. They all have the same privilege. So Infinite, again, uh, relies on a decentralized uh, uh, system, which means we don't have any central authority. So for the, for, the, for the consensus algorithm, uh, basically existing systems, so uh, in our uh, terminology, we, s we use the term distributed systems for the master-slave model, and we use the centralized system for peer-to-peer, -peer, where you don't have any specific uh, nodes. And for existing systems, like distributed systems, like, uh, where you have a master or a manager, the problem is that the consensus is going to take place within those manager nodes. So you can see the leader and the masters. And you have several problems with that. The first is that uh, it doesn't scale because the consensus algorithm is very heavy. It creates, it sends a lot of packets, a lot of messaging, messages between the nodes, between the manager nodes. And when you have three, it's okay. When you have five, it's okay. But when you grow to seven, it's not possible, it's just too slow. So the problem is with uh, distributed systems like that, with managers, you, would, you wouldn't be able to scale to, let's say, 10,000 servers, because to manage the 10,000 servers, you would probably need seven or maybe 15 uh, master servers. I don't know what I said, but if you have 1,000 slave servers, you're gonna need more master servers, let's say 15, and with 15 master servers, the consensus algorithm is going to be extremely slow. So it doesn't scale. Besides the complexity of scaling it uh, manually, I mean, uh, it just doesn't work. It's going to be too slow. So that's the first problem. So in our case, uh, what we did is that we don't have one consensus between all the nodes, which wouldn't make any sense, uh, or between a specific set of nodes, which is the same thing as the masters, uh, what we do is we have a multitude of consensus algorithm running in parallel. So, for instance, on the right side, you can see that we have three different quorums because uh, the consensus algorithm is run between the nodes responsible for the same, for the rep responsible for the replicas of the same block. So, for instance, the quorum run 
is composed of three nodes, and the three nodes have a replica of one specific block. Okay? And this means that we can actually run three uh, consensus algorithm in parallel, and they involve actually three, nine different nodes. In the context of managers, if you were to, to run three uh, uh, consensus algorithm in parallel, that would be super heavy on the manager nodes because they are the only one that can actually do it. So it is very complicated, heavy, so they have to absorb that, so you need to kind of provision your servers to be masters, and it doesn't scale because if you want to grow uh, your uh, scale out your, your system, you're gonna need more master servers and then it doesn't scale because it's going to be too slow. So you have big problems with that. In our case, with a decentralized approach, you can scale to one million nodes. It doesn't change anything because the currents are always going to be composed of three nodes. In other words, in the context of infinite, so a decentralized system, the relation between the complexity of the consensus algorithm is the complexity of the consensus algorithm is linked to the replication factor. If it is three, you can see that you have three nodes in the consensus. If you grow it to five, then you're going to have five nodes per, cor per, per quorum. But for the first one, it is directly linked to the size of your cluster. So if you scale it out to a thousand nodes, you have a big problem. In our case, we've designed it to grow to 10 million nodes, which is not going to be used in the context of Docker, I assume, but still. So it means better scalability, it is faster, more secure because you don't have a big surface of attack, and it is actually more fault tolerant. That is it for uh, the differentiator uh, with other systems. And now regarding the demo, as I promised, I won't do it because I don't have time and I'm sorry about that. But basically, uh, I invite you to go to our website, which is infinite.sh. Uh, you'll have a get started, which takes no more than 10 minutes, which will get you through uh, deploying a cluster of three, four nodes, uh, defining the policies, having a file system mounted on several clients, sharing data, inviting a new user to your cluster, uh, and um, playing with the access control in the file system. So, not everything, uh, but already uh, that gives you an idea. Maybe just to finish, uh, to give you uh, 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 some explanation regarding what you see on the screen, uh, because that's basically what you'll be doing. The first thing that you will be doing through the Get Started Guide is that you will create a user, because in the context of Infinite, the first thing you do is create a user, which is basically a public-private key, or a key pair. And that, will, that key pair will be used in the future for access control, or just to identify your user when you're deploying stuff. After that, you will create a storage resource that you can see through the infinite-storage binary. <clears throat> and in this case, you can see that you create a storage resource that is named local, that is going to contribute 10 gigabytes of storage capacity, the blocks of data of the key that you store are going to be placed on the local file system, that's why you have the dash dash file system, in the path slash var slash infinite slash storage slash local, okay? So this is just to say uh, this node, this server on which I'm operating is going to put the block it receives in this folder. Then you create a network, which is infinite-network. The network is basically the key value store, so overlay and the DHT. So the network, you create it, you name it cluster in this case, and you say the server on which I'm operating, I want to contribute its storage capacity, so basically the storage resource I just defined, which is local with the 10 gigabyte, I want to contribute that from this server, and then you define the policies of the key value store, in this case, I've used replication factor three to say we want to replicate every block of data three times. And finally, you're going to create a, a storage logic, in this case, a file system by using a volume. So you say infinite dash volume dash dash create. You say I want to create a volume, so a file system on top of the key value store name cluster, and I want to name the volume tests. And finally, 
you do, you mount your file system by doing infinite uh, uh, volume dash dash mount. By default, it uses the fuse interface and uh, you name the volume you want to mount, you activate the policy caching and you specify the mount point and that's it. At this point, you have a mount point that you could actually mount also on another node, in which case you would actually share data. And the last step, just to show, would be to actually do a Docker run uh, so that you actually run an application, a container, and you say, I want to map uh, this uh, part of the file system in my container to the mount point so that it is never lost. And that's it. Since the data is replicated three times, you have a low probability of losing your data. That is basically it. Any questions with the blue box? Oh, wow. That was not my question. <laughs> So uh, when you created the cluster and you uh, say the replication is three, does that mean the data, like th two other nodes are going to join the cluster and that's where the Sorry, data so will be replicated? Oh, so uh, when you say the replication factor is three, right? Um, does that indicate that two other nodes are going to join that cluster where the data will be replicated? No, no, it means that, uh, it means that your cluster, mm, going to explain. Uh, your cluster, if you had a cluster, in this case you have a single node. So I, simp I've, I have simplified the flow, obviously. But what you would need to do is to uh, create your cluster first with, let's say, 10 nodes, and then you would actually say, uh, I mean, you would have said replication factor three, and then you would add another node, another node, another node, another node. What is interesting though, with your question, uh, I, I'm going to add that, is that uh, most systems, if you take for instance Ceph, uh, most system needs uh, to have enough storage servers compared to the replication factor for you to start storing. For instance, it may sound completely stupid to you to say that you could start storing with a replication factor of three even though you have a single server doesn't really make sense, right? So most, most systems actually prevent you from storing data until you have enough servers. It is not the case for infinite. You can start storing data in this case. It will work. What the system knows is that it is not in a healthy state because it hasn't replicated the data yet. But when you do join one more node, the data will be replicated on the new node. A third one, you have a third replica. A fourth one, it knows that it already reached an LC state, so we're good. Okay? Yep. 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 Uh, the DHT, is it storing the mappings of the file location or the actual, like, bytes of the blocks? So, um, the mapping between files and blocks are done within the file system logic. So the DHT doesn't understand the concept of file. It doesn't, it does only understand the concept of blocks. What are the keys in the DHT, the, the, the segments of the? Of the file? files, right? Right, and so the contents, the payload, is that in the DHT yes. as a value? Yes, so basically the metadata, uh, uh, the equivalent of an inode, right, of, uh, I've got this uh, access control, I've got this uh, information, and the list of the blocks composing my file. This is a block as well. So the metadata uh, for a file system, uh, so the, really the equivalent of an inode, would actually also be stored in the DHT, so also replicated. And with, with uh, Infinite and Docker coming together, does that mean that the primary use case in the future for the storage will be only with Docker, or you kind of alluded that with really large scale, maybe other applications as well? So I don't know if everyone hear the, the questions, but the question is, um, with uh, Infinite joining Docker, uh, is it going to be only uh, Docker oriented, basically like merge into Docker? Uh, that's a good question. 
uh, I would say that on the short term, no, uh, but on the long term, I don't know. I'm not necessarily the one who decides, but um, the way we've designed Infinite, however, is to be a standalone storage solution. So, I mean, the, 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 the day we started working on it, there was no context of containers, and actually, you can deploy that in VMs, you can deploy that on bare metal, it doesn't change anything for us. Uh, the only way today we integrate with Docker is by providing a volume plugin. So you don't need to use container to deploy Infinite. You can deploy it manually, but what we intend to do is to simplify the way you deploy storage infrastructures through Docker. Thanks. If you, if you do have um, three nodes in your cluster, are you guaranteeing that each of the replicas is on a separate node? Yes. Okay. Uh, it depends on what you mean, though. Uh, on different nodes, yes, but it could actually end up on the same server, physical server, if you have two sure. nodes running on the same. You have top. three availability zones, and you stick a different VM on each availability zone. You're, you're guaranteeing that each of those is, assume, you know, some yeah. of your competences have been. Um, second one is if, if one of those nodes goes offline, so your quorum now only sees uh, two copies of itself. Yeah. So it goes ahead and does its right, and it says, okay, we have two, we, we have, we, two of us say yay, so we're gonna do this right, and then the third node comes back online, what happens then? So we basically do that, is that if one goes down, we're gonna wait for it to come back, mm -hmm. which is, again, configurable, and because that's often what happens. One goes down, it reboots, or it just, by being disconnected, it connects back, and that's it, and we recheck that, that's the node that had the block, and, and it rejoins the quorum. And after some time, what's gonna happen is that we're going to evict the node, which is no longer here, from the quorum, which is gonna be then only two. And we're gonna elect a new node to join the quorum. And once we've done that, we create, we send him the new replica so that we, goes back, we go back to a healthy state. So you basically wait some period of time for it to come back, but it doesn't come back to replicate. Yeah. list of data stores that work really well or don't work? A list of data stores. MySQL or RabbitX. So at this point, the only uh, API that interface that is available uh, is Fuse with the file system. So we haven't deployed databases on it because we, we haven't benchmarked having a database on the file system First, because we had very limited resources. Secondly, because as I explained, that's not the way to do it. You should have a block device. And the block device, we don't have it yet. So the answer is no. <laughs> I think the key value store will be available for as a key value store, or is it for managing? Uh, no, we intend to open source uh, the different layers. Uh, so we've started working on that and we intend to open source the key value store and give bindings in different languages or still to be defined. But the idea is that we believe that the key value store is uh, much better than what is on the market today. So we'd like everyone to benefit from it so that they can actually have something which is really strong, uh, reliable, have strong, strong consistency, can be customized to develop whatever they want. They could develop, I don't know, a, a chat client, which is completely decentralized, or whatever they want, and an email client, or just yeah, feel free to do that. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna do that. Um, if you want to know, uh, you can uh, go to our website, subscribe to our blog, or whatever, and, 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 and you'll, you'll know when we do that. So if we've got views running in our container, and we're mounting on storage. What's the benefit to using infinite instead? If you are, sorry, say again. So if we've if we've got um, views and we're actually mounting uh, like S three, S three. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits to use infinite instead of that? Uh, many. <laughs> 
So I would say first, uh, with F3, it depends where you run, but the latency could be fatal. Uh, if you are in your own data center and you want to access data on F3 every time, it may be very slow. But if but, the instances are in AWS. Okay. Uh, if they're in AWS, uh, I don't think you should use uh, Fuse uh, plus S3. I think you should use EBS. Uh, I think it's EBS, the file system, um, which is a block device provided by Amazon, um, I think. Well, it depends on what you want to do. But um, uh, the, the, the benefits are that if you, go, if you do that, you're locked in Amazon, basically. You're going to use S3 from Amazon, uh, the EC2 from Amazon, and you're using Docker, but uh, yeah, you're basically using Amazon. Now, it's, it, I'm, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm, not, I'm just saying that it's not for everyone. Um, the other benefit is that um, you're going to be able to really configure, customize your storage to the needs of your application, which is not going to be the case for uh, an S3 plus a mount point. Plus, if you do that, uh, you don't have access control. Plus, it's not designed for that because it's an object store which is mounted, which is just, just a hack. So, yeah, I don't know. It just, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, it, it, it just, it's not, it, it hasn't been designed to have uh, a, a POSIX mount point on top of S3. It's not the purpose. Uh, so it works. It's nice. It's basically like having a Gmail FS. You can store data on Gmail. But, uh, yeah. For, for, for shit and giggles, it's nice, but uh, if you want to do something in production, it's probably not what you should do. I mean, that's my opinion, obviously, but yeah. Sorry? Yeah, also. Very good argument, I should have. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Strong consistency, we have it. F3 is eventual uh, consistent, so you wouldn't have strong consistency. And for a five system, I would, uh, I would prefer having a strongly consistent uh, system. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm um, just curious on when I'm looking at the, consist, uh, the consensus, um, since it's distributed and I'm looking at consensus across uh, redundancies that share the same data set, Let's say that there is an inconsistency, a disagreement. Uh, how is that resolved? I presume there's some sort of timestamp that will decide this one is more fresh, but you know that has some weakness in that. Okay, this one is newer, but this is one out of five, and therefore less accurate. And how do the rest of those bubble up? And how do you eventually like squash something that is in disagreement? So. <laughs> How to begin? Uh, where to begin? Sorry. Um, it cannot happen. Uh, you cannot disagree. Uh, uh, basically, um, so we use a, uh, an algorithm which is called Paxos, which is uh, in the same vein as probably all have, uh, all have heard of Raft. Uh, Raft is uh, not adapted in our case because. Um, it is very heavy in terms of messaging. It already talks, it is active, so it, it needs to talk a lot. And uh, Paxos is passive, meaning that nothing is exchanged until you actually need to decide on something. And since we've, we've seen that we have many consensus running, many columns, if we had Raft, everyone would be talking all the time to each other, so it, it wouldn't work. So Paxos is uh, more adapted in our case, but also we. Yeah, Raft is uh, not really our thing. But um, to answer the question, basically when you're trying to update a piece of data, you are going to try to reach agreement within the quorum of nodes. It is a quite complicated algorithm. Uh, and, and basically when you get the, uh, the answer that tells you it worked, you can be assured that it works. They can't have disagreed, basically. It doesn't mean that all the servers have the data yet, but you are in a state where if you do a, a request to read the data, you are sure that you will see the latest version, so strongly consistent. 
Um, but yeah, it's not like uh, it's not like just we we put versions and uh, and, uh, and 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 we're going to find the one with the latest version it doesn't work like that. That would be just uh, uh, why well, it wouldn't work. It's it's really it's really complicated actually at this part. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> if you want to know more, uh, I invite you to read the, some information on Paxos. It will explain to you a bit of the problem it's trying to solve. But again, I could talk for an hour about uh, the history of this problem. But uh, yeah, it is a very difficult problem in distributed systems. So it's not something, it's like cryptography. You don't rewrite cryptographic algorithm. You let people who know it do it. Uh, because it is very, very complicated. Uh, so yeah, that's the same thing. You we we read that. You, you mentioned that the uh, block um, block devices were not yet supported. Mm. Uh, object storage supported not. So the object storage uh, is uh, in the making. In the making. Um, what about erasure coding? Is that part of it now, or a plan? Not yet. And uh, encryption arrest now? Yes, it is provided, yes. It is, does have that, okay. Should make people pay for questions. So touching on what he said earlier in regards to uh, the clustering um, across the different nodes, how are you ensuring that, uh, and maybe I, I didn't hear it, but how are you ensuring the transactions are consistent across all the different nodes in terms of replication, in terms of same storage type, in terms of data? Um, like what he said, and I probably I didn't understand what you were saying. You um, mentioned something about PAC. So probably I just need to learn <laughs> about that. But um, for the transactions in each node, how do you, sure that it is the right data across all the different nodes. So it's not all, uh, it's not all the nodes, but only the nodes that are going to store a replica, right? Uh, the questions tend to be, uh, explain to me Paxos. So uh, um, um, how do we do that? It's basically, we are going to contact. So first we go through the overlay network to find nodes that are going to host the data. Either it is the first time we're going to store this block or we're going to update uh, these blocks so we find the nodes that already host a replica for this block. And then we use the Paxos algorithm to contact the nodes uh, or contact one node and they are going to talk to each other to make sure that uh, they decide on something. It doesn't really, it's not important what they decide from the algorithm perspective. What's important is that they all decide the same thing. You don't want them to decide two different things. So the basic scenario is two clients updating the same file. The file is going to be split into blocks. We're going to push the blocks in the, in the, in the key value store, and we're going to then contact the three nodes, for instance, if I pick only one block, the three nodes that are going to host the replicas for this block. And so the two clients try to contact maybe two nodes of the quorums of three, and they are going to start doing the Paxos algorithm, which is basically uh, contact the other one by saying, okay, I've received this request. Are you okay with accepting this modification? But since the other one also received the request, he also sends messages to the other one saying, I've received this request, do you accept this one? So you've got a conflict. And the algorithm is made so that you retry and eventually you converge into picking one out of the other and the other one is just rejected, okay? But again, uh, it is, uh, <laughs> That's probably the best they can do in the... Uh, no, that's uh, fine, that's fine. I, I just wanted to get a better understanding of what yeah. you were trying to explain. So it's called Paxo? Paxos. P-A-X-O-S. Okay. okay, I'll look that up. Thanks. Do you, have you ever considered using blockchain as a transaction to ensure the consistency across the, the different nodes? So it's not exactly... Uh, it wouldn't be exactly adapted, but we have a uh, um, concept which has very 
uh, very close, for instance, uh, the concept of blockchain is to have a hash, a chain of hash, right? And uh, what we use is Merkle trees, which is a, a tree of hash. And that's for the data where if you modify one byte in a sub block, it actually changes all the tree. So you can verify easily uh, that something has been modified, for instance. So it's the same idea, but done differently because we do it really in the context of storing data, having access control, and having redundancy in the context of blockchain, it is very much everyone keeps everything. But uh, in, in our case, we want to control exactly how much storage capacity is being used from the nodes. So it's, it's not exactly the same use case. So we wouldn't be able to use a blockchain like uh, uh, system. But we have similar concepts. Thanks. I have two questions. Um, so what technology do you use to implement your... Uh, uh, Sorry, platform? say again? Uh, what technology do you use to implement your uh, platform? Is it uh, Golang or is it Java? And another, <laughs> and Java another question, or oh, it could be whatever. <laughs> another question is, uh, are you planning to implement like kernel mode driver for the file system? Uh, implement a... Kernel mode driver for the file system? Not likely. So the first answer is C++. That's what we use. Uh, but again, we have specific C++ development framework based on coroutines. So it, it, it has some, again, concepts related to Go. But we've done that in C++. And the reasons are numerous. The first one is that back in the days, Go wasn't stable, so we couldn't use it. Uh, and I guess that's enough uh, for a reason. Um, the other answer is, uh, would we actually provide a kernel module, so put all the file system in the kernel? The answer is no, because C++, it is heavy, uh, heavy code. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, uh, in a distributed systems like that, what really uh, impacts the performances is the latency of the network. So uh, it's not, you're not going to gain that much by doing that. I mean, but we would need to really bench it, benchmark it, but uh, it, it, it sounds natural. I see, thank you. Um, decentralize typically lead to another problem, that is uh, management. Because uh, you say, let's say, you don't even easily be able to grab how much utilization it has been there. The other problem would be also similar. Um, you have some nodes, they are really slow. They have? Because they are, they are slow for whatever reason. Maybe uh -huh. they just have some last century block uh, mm -hmm. uh, disk. So how do you solve this performance issue? So for the first one, you were saying what, monitoring or something? It's kind of, you decentralize your system. It, it causes more trouble on management. Yes, okay. So uh, it's true that some things are going to be more complicated to do than having all the information in one place and, and controlling exactly who's doing what. Now, I want to stress one thing is that we could at some point introduce a centralized entity that knows everything regarding one aspect because it's the best thing to do. But it wouldn't, uh, what's really important to us is that the core of the distribution is decentralized because we believe it's the best way to do it. It doesn't necessarily mean that if we are really stuck not being able to do everything in the decentralized way, we wouldn't introduce something which is centralized as long as uh, it is not uh, something that can be uh, under heavy pressure and could actually break or could be could just fail because too many requests. That's what is really important. And that's the core of the storage system is the distribution of the blocks. And that has to be well distributed. And we think that that's the way to do it and not in a master-slave model or centralized way. For the second question, which was, I don't remember. Um. The second, the second question would be, you have some node, they are really slow. Oh, yeah. It could be someone just poison one node yeah. into your network. 
and so, it will slow down everything. So yeah, uh, not necessarily everything though, because uh, our algorithm could very well, and they actually do already do that, is that you're going to be latency based, so you're going to fetch data from the block that actually answers quickly. But you could argue that for storing data, you're going to be forced to, at some point, update the slow servers. Now the answer, the right answer to that is that even if you have a master-slave model, you have the same problem. If you have slow servers, it's really not our problem. What we provide is the software that is, from our point of view, intelligent, that really gives intelligence to your servers. Um, you would have the same kind of so software in your NetApp or EMC appliance, except that we get it out, we do it well, and we give it to you so that you can run it everywhere. So nothing prevents you from buying their uh, servers, having a super network and putting infinite on it. It will be super fast. But uh, if you don't want to do that and have a crappy connection, don't blame me. Uh, I mean, it's your problem. Uh, we won't be able to help you. And the same applies for some people say, yeah, we can do uh, data center uh, redundancy. Yes, we can do that with infinite. And it may be slow. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we can't beat physics, as we say. So yeah, it's really up to you. Uh, the, the way you're going to deploy it, that's your job. We provide you the software and the customization, uh, and after that, uh, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm saying that this is not a problem. Judging by some of the things that you've mentioned, um, latency, uh, data center, replication, um, I wanted to know what your input was about handing geographical distribution mm -hmm. with the file system. Uh, well, it depends what you mean. Only worldwide. data center or in general? Like a worldwide distribution. Worldwide. Well, it depends the type of systems. Uh, firstly, I'd say that for a five system, so you mentioned a five system. Yeah, I would be against for a five system. But um, for, let's say, an object storage, you could say, why not? Because maybe the performance of storing data is not that important. Uh, so the latency you don't care, and it is eventually consistent, so it's not going to be impacted as much. Um, but still, again, it's really what you want. Likewise, for instance, we have an approach which is safety first. So what we want is to make sure that you never lose data before providing the best performances, for instance. And many storage vendors actually go for performance first and safety second, which my, my experience doesn't make any sense because if you're deploying that on a large cluster, if you have a probability of having a problem, mathematically you will have the problem. So, uh, yeah, it, it really depends on what you want to do. But uh, what we do is safety first, and, and then the deployment is up to you. You can customize, you can test, and if, if it's okay with what you want, why not? But to answer your question, uh, I would be against uh, for a five system, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I hope that's not too much questions. Uh, so just, just some really quick question. Is there deduplication and how is deduplication handled? So not. <laughs> no, OK. No, we haven't implemented it yet. So there's like a roadmap for it? I suppose. <laughs> okay. No, no, seriously, uh, we're not at this stage yet. But uh, since we are working right now on the object storage, uh, deduplication and compression are going to become important, erasure coding as well. So uh, yeah, yeah I, I can't tell you when. But uh, it is going to be in the roadmap pretty soon, yeah. Okay, thank you. Come on, one more. <laughs> that's uh, that's not a short answer. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll do that very quickly. Uh, the theory was my PhD, so from 2007 to 2010, so it's been already 10 years. Then we created the company, but uh, it was a long and difficult road where we started working on that, then we pivoted to another product for years. So basically, in 2012, or early 2012, we really started to work on it as a company. So starting really developing the thing. And uh, 2012, we stopped. Uh, but we kept working on the core libraries, which are very important, the C++ development framework that I mentioned earlier. So we kept working on that in the context of the other product. And back in mid-2015, we, we, we came back to that. So in practice, on this, this, it's been a year and a half. Okay. Uh, yeah, we... We are not starting from scratch because we have knowledge and we also have the, the, the core libraries that help us a lot. But otherwise, it's been a year and a half, which is a very short period of time for a storage system. Any more questions? We good? Okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming. And um, thank you to our amazing speakers. And don't forget to register for DockerCon. The early bird yeah. discount ends tomorrow. So get your tickets. Bye.